Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Council on Foreign Relations. Nice to see such a full house. Here today, this is the History Maker Series event, and um, on behalf of the Council, I'd like to thank Richard Plepler and Home Box Office for their generous support of this series. Um, the History Maker Series focuses on the contributions made by prominent, a prominent person at a critical juncture uh, in U.S. foreign policy or in international relations, and that certainly describes our guest speaker today. While you may know her as Aretha Franklin's piano player, <laughs> um, this classically trained pianist earned her respect on a global stage. Condoleezza Rice served as Secretary of State, of course, from 2005 until the end of the George W. Bush administration in 2009. She was the second African American and the second woman to hold that prestigious, to say the least, cabinet position. As the nation fought two wars, Secretary Rice sought to advance democracy in the Middle East through diplomacy to encourage and foster democratic states and strengthen ties to America's allies in a critical region. Shortly after her confirmation as Secretary of State, she delivered a speech in France outlining her vision and philosophy as chief diplomat for this country. She said, quote, even more important than military and economic power is the power of ideas, the power of compassion, and the power of hope. While the work to foster sustainable democracy and achieve equality for women and minorities around the world continues today, Secretary Rice no doubt remains resolute in the hope that these goals will in fact be fully realized. Prior to her role as Secretary of State, she served President Bush as National Security Advisor and before that, she was provost of Stanford University. She's returned to Stanford, where she's currently the Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow on Public Policy at the Hoover Institution. So please join me in welcoming Secretary Rice. And I was asked to deliver one polite reminder before we begin our conversation. If it rings or buzzes, turn it off, please. <laughs> Also, this meeting, by the way, is on the record. So, Secretary Rice, it's nice to be with you. I've had the privilege of interviewing you on a number of occasions for a number of different media outlets. So, it's nice to be here at the Council. So, it's been almost two years since uh, the Bush administration ended. I'm just curious about your time away from Washington. Has it changed your perspective at all on foreign policy or the ways of Washington? Well, it's changed my perspective in one very important way. I get up in the morning and I read the newspaper and I think, isn't that interesting? <laughs> uh, and then I go Instead on to of something oh else. That's right, exactly. <laughs> uh, with, with a little bit of time, you do have a chance to, to look back and to uh, try and gain perspective. Of course, a lot of the issues uh, in which we uh, were involved are still unfolding and will be unfolding uh, for some time. But uh, I'm quite confident that uh, the emphasis that you mentioned on uh, democracy is both the right emphasis and one uh, that will demonstrate that it has been uh, the right emphasis. Um, I'm also very grateful that when I go around the, the world, and I'm still going around the world, uh, that people remember uh, not just the war on terrorism, but uh, the Compassion Agenda. We've just had World AIDS Day. And uh, the U.S. leadership in uh, that role is very well uh, remembered. I was recently in Africa, and uh, the work to increase foreign assistance and uh, girls' education and health programs in Africa is very well remembered. And so um, in, in retrospect, I think the marriage of American power and principle uh, is going to guide our foreign policy for a long time uh, if it's to be successful. We, we t talked about this when I was... Uh privilege to do a 60 Minutes profile about you, but, and, and it was interesting for me to, to revisit some of the things you and I talked about in that profile with the book you've just published called Extraordinary Ordinary People, A Memoir of Family. And you talk a lot about your childhood in the Jim Crow South. And, and of course, I, 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 I know what you're going to say, but a lot of people here may not. Tell us how that, in many ways, your experiences growing up in the South, dealing with racism, um, 
how that impacted your view, views on foreign policy. Well, first of all, it impacted me as a person. Um, but I had parents who were ordinary people in the title. They were, my mom was a school teacher. Uh, she taught English first. And by the way, one of her first students was uh, the great ball player, Willie Mays. And uh, he remembers her as uh, Miss Ray, who told him, son, you're going to be a ball player. And so if you need to leave class a little bit early, you go right ahead and do that. <laughs> and uh, didn't sound like my mother, that, but maybe It's very counterintuitive. Yes, <laughs> very much so. And uh, my father was a high school guidance counselor, Presbyterian minister. So these were ordinary people. But in the extraordinary circumstances of Birmingham, a place where you couldn't go into a restaurant, you couldn't stay in a hotel, uh, still, they had me, as I've, as, as I've often said, convinced that I could be President of the United States if I wanted to be. And uh, they had us convinced as a community of children uh, that you might not be able to uh, control your circumstances, but you could control your response to your circumstances. And that was the critical issue. Uh, it led me, I think, to understand in uh, my approach to foreign policy the importance um, of that principle, that human spirit can overcome essentially anything if given a chance, but also the need for that human spirit to be empowered in some way. And so whether it is the education and empowerment of women or uh, the education of children who might otherwise not have uh, a chance uh, at education, um, if you want to empower the human spirit to do great things, uh, you have to give people tools uh, which give some hope, and that's, for me, uh, the link. And I know you talked about the fact that if you look at people in certain countries and say they don't deserve democracy, yeah. or it's not yeah. perhaps it's not necessarily in their DNA right. in terms of their societal structure, et cetera, you, you describe that as being tantamount to racism. Oh, it is. It's, it's patronizing and it's racist. Uh, the idea that there are some people in some corner of the earth who um, are uh, so uh, un, uh, so lacking in uh, human character that they really don't care um, whether or not they can say what they think. They really don't care if they can select those who are going to govern them. They really don't care if they can uh, worship as they please. And oh, by the way, they don't care about the knock of the secret police at night. Um, I think it's incredibly patronizing to believe that that's true. And the United States, of all places, should recognize that uh, democracy takes a long time, but that it is very well worth it. Not too long before uh, my experiences in Birmingham, this was a country that believed that, well, black people were just a little bit too childlike to care about things like the vote. And so whenever we say that there is someone out there that either doesn't have a tradition or they're not ready, um, I think you have to check your prejudices. Let's talk about your first job as National Security Advisor for President Bush. Um, well, actually, let's, let's have you use some hindsight about President Bush. I know that you all still stay in mm -hmm. touch. But now that you're out of Washington and probably have even a better perspective on some of the things that transpired during your tenure, what would you consider are President Bush's greatest strengths and biggest weaknesses? Mm -hmm. I think his greatest strengths uh, were uh, and are decisiveness, uh, but um, informed decisiveness. I don't know where this caricature comes from, that uh, this was a president who was uninterested in uh, argumentation, uninterested in details, not curious uh, somehow about the world. It's, it's simply not true. He was someone and is someone who has a very um, admirable, but sometimes if you're the person in the chair being asked the question, somewhat disturbing tendency to go right to the essence of the issue and to ask the question that maybe you didn't think to uh, ask yourself. And so uh, he had this very strategic mind and he was able then to be decisive. And uh, you need decisiveness. Uh, it was married with a bedrock belief in the goodness of America and indeed the exceptionalism of America that America had uh, certain responsibilities uh, that it had to execute on behalf of all of humankind, whether it was uh, fighting terrorism or, or trying to uh, deliver democracy. But it was also uh, that America had special responsibility to be compassionate, which is where the entire president's uh, program for emergency um, AIDS relief came from, was that 
I remember very well the session in the Oval Office when uh, he said, you know, a lot of is, is expected of those to whom a lot is given. And uh, so those characteristics coming together, um, I think, made for a president who drew on um, America's strengths in very uh, important ways. Um, we all have our weaknesses. And uh, I think that President Bush somehow uh, was not able across the airwaves uh, to communicate uh, the kind of leader that he uh, was. Um, I have said, heard so many people, particularly recently as he's been out on this book tour, say, but you know, but he's funny, he's got this sense of humor, he's got this active mind. And um, somehow when you're standing in front of uh, the press, with all due respect, Katie, and uh, <laughs> you are uh, in a press conference where if you misplace a comma, you have just changed U.S. policy on the Middle East, um, it's hard to communicate who you are. And I think there was a disconnect. Uh, between uh, who he was as president and the president that uh, people saw. When you saw him appear in public and you felt that the president you knew and you had spent time with and exchanged ideas with was not coming across to the rest of the country, that must have been extraordinarily frustrating for you. It, it was because um, I think it made the job of doing difficult things more difficult. And um, I, I don't think that I came across um, as who I am either, and people say that to me either, because it really is hard when you're standing there and you're trying to uh, make certain that every word is, uh, is right and it's not going to be misunderstood, because uh, if you slip and say this or that, then you've just created a headline and a firestorm. So it's hard for everybody. But uh, it was especially uh, frustrating because uh, all of us who got to see the President um, in daily exchange knew uh, very much how curious a person this was, how well informed and um, how uh, I intent on doing the right thing. And, and by the way, not caring about the day's headlines, but rather about uh, history's judgment. I think with, that when you're trying your hardest to be eloquent, that's when you're usually the most yes. inarticulate. Right. Um, <laughs> let, 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 let's talk about 9-11. Obviously, that changed everything. Did you realize that this event, as it was unfolding, would define the rest of the Bush presidency and change the world forever? Several days after, um, when the, the first couple of days, 9-11 and the two or three days after, where were you we were, when this happened? I was in the White House. It was, uh, ironically, the president normally would travel with either me or Steve Hadley, the deputy. And that particular day, that Tuesday, he had gone down to Florida for this little education, little education event of four hours or so. And so we, neither of us went. So uh, here we were in the White House when this happened. I was at my desk. And uh, the first plane went into the World Trade Center, and we thought it was an accident. The second plane went into the World Trade Center, and we thought, my God, it's a terrorist attack. And I can remember trying to get Don Rumsfeld on the phone, and his phones were just ringing, and a plane had gone into the Pentagon. And uh, so I was spirited off to the, to the bunker, uh, but I stopped first uh, and called my family because I know the Rices and the Rays, and I said, you know, Washington, awful pictures. I'm okay. But then I took a call from the president, and I did something that I had not ever done, and I never did after that. I raised my voice to the president of the United States because he said, I'm coming back. And I said, no, you're not. I said, it's, we're under attack, and you're, you have got to get to safety. So that day was um, like being in a fog where you were just trying to deal with the consequences. Three or so days later, when we were at Camp David, uh, looking at the map of Afghanistan, and knowing that we were going to go over to war in Afghanistan, that's when it occurs to you that you are uh, about to engage in shaping e events that are going to shape history in a completely different direction. You're about to be, uh, for him, the war president, and uh, America is in a fight um, for a long time. And then I think we knew that it was going to be um, not just something that would, would fade from the screen. There's still a great deal of controversy over the warning signs that may not have been sufficiently heeded prior to 9-11. Are there things in retrospect you wish you had done differently in terms of analyzing, interpreting some of the intelligence that came in? Obviously, we didn't do enough because it happened. 
But uh, that said, I know what that intelligence looked like. And uh, that intelligence, um, as murky as it was, and it was very murky, the warnings say things like, a big event is about to happen in the terrorist chatter. A big event is about to happen. And all of the warning signs were that it would happen abroad in uh, Israel, Jordan, or possibly in Genoa at the uh, G8 that was being held that July. And so we did what you do in response to those warnings. We moved American forces, um, naval forces out of port. Uh, we took extraordinary uh, measures for our embassies uh, abroad to try to protect. Um, as it turns out, just because I thought, well, maybe something, the United States, something's there, uh, we called together the, um, the agencies that were domestic agencies, and I called the Attorney General and said, you know, here's the briefing, and uh, people were, were alerted. But uh, nothing suggested that there was an attack of that sort coming in the United States. Now, I think this was a systemic failure because uh, we were stovepiped between domestic intelligence, or FBI, and law enforcement, and foreign intelligence, and the CIA. And both by tradition and law, they could not share uh, information. And perhaps if they had been able to share information, somebody might have been able to put together a picture of what was coming. But even with the sharing, um, I doubt that you would have put together that particular picture. After 9-11, government agencies opened up the flow of information to foster better intelligence sharing, but that may have opened the government up yeah. to the kind of leaks that we've seen or the kind of exposure we've seen from WikiLeaks. Uh, Fareed Zakaria just wrote a, a piece in Time where he said the leaks are in some ways an unintended consequence of Washington finally getting its information act together. So have the floodgates been opened too much? How do you find the proper balance? Well, let me say first that um, I think what has happened is a crime. Uh, it's up to the Justice Department to figure out exactly what crime it is. But uh, it's got to be prosecuted and punished, or it's going to keep happening. And the, the, I hope that the penalty is really severe, because maybe that will deter this kind of behavior. The United States can't exist in a world in which uh, we can't share information within the government and uh, with, the, uh, with the expectation that it's somehow going to end up uh, in, on the front pages of, of newspapers. You can't do business that way. So I hope it's prosecuted, and I hope it's prosecuted severely. Um, secondly, though, uh, it did occur to me um, that probably the sharing, it looks maybe, has gone too far. And I know that Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates are looking into uh, this, the idea that somehow cables from our embassy in Germany are being read at the staff sergeant level uh, at our military bases seems to be rather odd. And uh, <laughs> I think uh, probably the flow of information has gotten a little, um, a little loose. Sloppy. A little sloppy. <laughs> uh, the third thing is, you know, you really don't have to write down everything you think. And, uh, <laughs> Save that for your diary. Yeah, uh, some, <laughs> some of the cables, I have to say, I, I thought, not the, not the analysis of circumstances and so forth, but some of the cables I thought to myself, you know, do you really need to write that down? Uh, so do, do you think the, these leaks have been damaging or just embarrassing? No, I think they've been damaging. I, I think they've been damaging because people will watch what they say to us. Um, in some cases um, where in, uh, interestingly, some authoritarian countries where people were saying one thing to their populations and to their parliaments and another to us, it's uh, going to be not just embarrassing, but it could have real consequences. That's so, for, for example, in Yemen. Exactly. And so I think that's, uh, that's a real problem. And uh, for uh, several of our diplomats, um, I think their relations with the countries and the leaders with whom they have to deal every day are irre irre irrevocably broken. So it's done real damage. Let's talk about enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, do you have any regrets about that program? Um, look, I knew there would be second guessing about um, what we did. Um, the president was very clear. Uh, he wanted to do what was legal and necessary. And he was very clear that the Justice Department would have to say, uh, unprompted, the Justice Department would have to review and say what was legal 
and we would live within those bounds both domestically and internationally. But when you are in a war, not a law enforcement activity, it is your responsibility to try to stop the next attack. And the long pole in the tent for stopping the next attack is information. Now, um, I knew that there would be second guessing about not just enhanced interrogation, but about uh, the, the Patriot Act and about uh, terrorist surveillance and so forth and so on. And uh, it's perfectly legitimate in a, de in a um, uh, democratic society to have people debate uh, what was done and to, uh, to change the course. And in fact, as we got more um, knowledge about how Al-Qaeda operated and, and got on top of things, a lot of this did change. But the one thing, second guessing, I could never have lived with is if it had happened again. And if we had left somehow on the table things that might have prevented it from happening. So uh, my view was that if it, if it was legal and necessary, uh, then the President of the United States, under circumstances in which we just watched 3,000 people die and believed that many more were going to die, the President had an obligation to do it. And the most productive thing that came from these enhanced interrogation techniques in your view? I, I'm not going to uh, go into uh, details because I don't know and don't remember, frankly, what the firewall is between what is still classified <laughs> and what is not. But I will say this. Uh, the best thing that we did was to take Al-Qaeda's field generals off the battlefield. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, Abu Zubaydah, Ramzi bin al -Sheib. Uh, I'm very sorry that we weren't able to deliver Osama bin Laden um, to, the, uh, to justice. But uh, when we took those field generals off the field and when uh, we were able to determine how Al-Qaeda actually operated and what they were plotting and planning, the country was a lot safer. On Iraq, books have been written, as you know, many, many books, documentaries have been made about how intelligence was incorrectly analyzed and cherry-picked to build an argument for war. And memos from that time do suggest that officials knew there was a small chance of actually finding weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Well, wait a second. What? <laughs> there's, there's some things that seem to suggest that up in the build-up to, to the actual war mm -hmm. that there was some doubt uh, about that, wouldn't you say? That no. <laughs> well, actually, I don't agree with that. You don't at all. even no. with when Tony Blair met with the president in Washington. But you always are you one hundred percent sure when you're dealing with an opaque, secretive country in which there have been no inspections for years? No, you're not one hundred percent sure. But the preponderance of intelligence analysis, the preponderance of intelligence analysis from around the world was that he had had weapons of mass destruction. We knew he had used weapons of mass destruction. That was not a theoretical proposition. Right, no, that's he correct. He used them. Against the Kurds. Against the Kurds, against the Shia, uh, and against the Iranians. So he'd used them uh, several times. And uh, the preponderance of intelligence was that he was reconstituting, or had actually, in the intelligence estimate, reconstituted his biological and chemical capabilities. There was some debate about how far he had gotten on the nuclear front, some saying that with foreign help it could be a year, others saying it would be several years. So uh, no, it's simply not the case that there was, um, if you were in, in a position of decision making, uh, evidence to say that uh, it was likely that he did not have weapons of mass destruction. Now um, what we found is that uh, he was indeed breaking out of the constraints that had been put there. We all know the scandal of oil for food. Uh, that he was not as far along in that reconstitution as the intelligence had suggested. Uh, but the idea that somehow Saddam Hussein was not pursuing or was never going to pursue weapons of mass destruction I think is as misplaced as an argument that he had um, fully reconstituted. Well, if there weren't ultimately weapons of mass destruction found, what was then the rationale for war? Without that, is there another rationale other than the world is better off without Saddam Hussein? Well, that's a pretty good rationale, but, um, but let, me, <coughs> let me go back to the premise or the question. Um, in the absence of weapons of mass destruction, what was the, the it's true 
that you can only, that what you know today can affect what you know and do tomorrow, but what you know today cannot affect what you did yesterday. So the premise that somehow, uh, because weapons of mass destruction were not found in stockpiles, the um, rationale for the war was flawed, leaves out the fact that at the time that we decided to go to war, we thought there were weapons of mass destruction. So let's stipulate that. Now, we didn't worry about weapons of mass destruction, particularly in the hands of Russians. The Russians had 100,000, 100 times the, the weapons capability of Saddam Hussein. The problem was that Saddam Hussein had taken the world to war in really destructive wars twice, Iran and the Gulf War 91, dragged us into conflict again in 98, as President Clinton had responded to the problem there, violated repeatedly Security Council resolutions. The efforts that we were making to keep him in his box, whether it was uh, oil for food or, the, uh, or trying to keep his air forces on the ground through um, flying no-fly zones, um, he was shooting at our aircraft every day. Uh, he still refused to acknowledge that Kuwait was an independent country, and so on and so on. This was the most uh, dangerous tyrant in the middle of the Middle East. And he had repeatedly um, flaunted the efforts of the international community to control him after 91. And so I think there is an argument that in those circumstances, uh, getting, Saddam, getting rid of Saddam Hussein is a very good thing. So absent of the, the presence, or if, if you had known at the time that Iraq wasn't as far along with its weapons program as it ultimately turned out to be, would all of those other things you mentioned provide rationale for the war? Katie, I'm going to repeat. What you know today can affect what you do tomorrow. No, but, but just not put yourself back there. I, I mean, you're saying I that do, that I seemed like a good I rationale. Do you think it is? I speculate on what I would have thought if I had known. I, I think it's not a fruitful exercise. We knew what we knew. And uh, we made the decisions based on that intelligence and that knowledge. Now, I still believe that um, even in the absence of finding weapons of mass destruction, uh, the world and the Middle East are much better places without Saddam Hussein. And you always can know what happened as a result of what you did. What you can't know is what would have happened had you not done it. Uh, the Iraq that we are talking about today, our debate about Iraq today, our concerns about Iraq today, are of course about continuing violence. But the conversation is whether Shia, Sunnis, Kurds can, within their new democratic institutions, form the first multi-confessional democracy in the Arab world. That's a really interesting discussion, and it's different than a discussion that we might have been having about whether or not the nuclear competition between Ahmadinejad and Iran and Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein in Iraq is a greater danger uh, than having taken Saddam Hussein out. Do so I actually think that might have been where we were. Do you think that democracy will hold in Iraq? I do. Um, the Iraqis are a tough people, right? and they're not easy. But I do think that they've got a chance in these new institutions to, um, to find a way to resolve their differences without somebody having to oppress somebody else, which has been the whole history of the Iraq and, in fact, the whole history of the Middle East. Um, it will take some time. The first couple of outcomes may not, in fact, be uh, very pretty to watch. But um, history has a long arc, and um, I think they've got a pretty good chance. Uh, two other global hotspots, and then I'm going to open up to members to ask questions. But Afghanistan, it seems to be such a quagmire, and, uh, and, and its future seems to be so uncertain. What do, you, what do you see happening in Afghanistan? Well, Afghanistan is um, future, an uncertain future. Look, it's always going to be hard. It's the fifth poorest country in the world. When you fly over it, you know why terrorists can hide there. You fly over those mountains, you realize that ungoverned area between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, it's a very hard place. 
It is, however, not a place where terrorists are plotting and planning um, to launch 9-11. It is uh, no longer a place where women are being executed in uh, soccer stadiums, as they were being by the Taliban. Uh, it is a place where girls are going to school. It's a place that has a, a not a, an ideal government, but a government. Um, and so things have improved in uh, Afghanistan. The question is, can we and our allies be patient enough to create circumstances or help the Afghans create circumstances in which the Taliban is not an existential threat to the government? The Taliban is going to be a hit and run organization for a long time. What about bringing them to the table, though? I was there in August, and many women who were in shelters who had fled from their husbands or their fathers, they were absolutely terrified at the prospect of the Taliban having some kind of negotiating power, which it has, yeah. with President Karzai, and what that would mean, and that, that w women's rights would be sold down the river in order to bring them into the fold. Well, it's one thing to bring Taliban foot soldiers into the fold. I think it's another to bring Taliban leadership into the fold and to expose uh, the citizens of Afghanistan to exactly the kind of danger that you just uh, um, addressed. And look, there has to be a defense of the Afghan constitution um, and women's rights. It is true that in a very traditional society, many Afghan women cannot fully exercise the rights that are guaranteed to them in the Constitution. Nonetheless, one advantage to constitutions is at least those rights are enshrined. And as we learned in our own country, the enshrining of those rights gives people who, uh, impatient patriots, the ability to argue in a context to say, you don't have to be something else, you just have to be who you say you are here. You just have to give us the rights that are already here. So I think uh, defending the Afghan constitution is going to be, have to be a very important uh, part of any negotiation that happens, hopefully not with uh, the upper ranks of the Taliban. And, and finally, Secretary Rice, or do I call you Professor Rice? Uh, what do I call you me, now? I could call me Connie. Okay. <laughs> um, what about or Condoleezza, our... <laughs> if you want to break that. <laughs> yeah. um, what about Iran and North Korea. Obviously, these were uh, countries that you were keeping an extremely close eye on and, and tried to deal with them in various ways during your tenure. Um, is the behavior of these countries surprising to you? Do you did you expect uh, North Korea to grow increasingly belligerent and, you know, with, it, with its recent attacks on South Korea? and Iran's nuclear ambitions don't seem to be, uh, they seem to be going full throttle? Well, I think the story's somewhat better on Iran, but let me address North Korea first. First of all, anybody who tries to judge the motives of Kim Jong-il and his family uh, is engaging in a very uh, iffy proposition. Um, it's a very closed place, as we know. Clearly, some kind of succession problem is being played out. And I think many people believe that when that succession problem was played out, it might lead the North Koreans to be more belligerent. Um, I don't think they're suicidal. And um, the um, efforts that the uh, Obama administration, uh, particularly Self Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates, and the uh, South Korean government uh, have undertaken, I think has given the North Koreans pause. Uh, and probably the Chinese pause as well, which is maybe an equally important part of this. And so I do continue to believe North Korea can be deterred, but it's going to be a dangerous period because with the internal ups and downs there, something is driving them to be uh, more belligerent. And we saw it right at the end of 2008 um, when they were walking away from things that they had already agreed uh, to do. Something was going on internally. On Iran, I think the picture is somewhat better. I think the years now of uh, cumulative sanctions on Iran, uh, going back to 2006 roughly, um, and the increasing severity of those sanctions, uh, married with the really uh, idiotic economic policies of Ahmadinejad and the impatience of the Iranian people that was exhibited in June of 2009, has made this a somewhat weaker uh, government. And it may be that, uh, not to mention the problems that they're having in their program, which the IAEA has uh, talked about, perhaps this is a time when the Iranians, someone within Iran who understands this isn't all going so well, uh, might be willing to, to strike a deal. 
So, well, we have a lot of uh, very smart people in our group th this uh, afternoon. So if members have any questions that they would like to ask Secretary Rice, go ahead. If you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, my name is Roland Paul. I'm a lawyer concerning weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, President Bush uh, reminded Bob Woodward in one of their interviews that uh, Saddam Hussein could have very quickly reconstituted, as you rev reference, uh, chemical and biological weapons. Our arms inspectors found the same thing, and everybody agrees that he sooner or later would have been determined to acquire nuclear weapons. But I was always mystified why the Bush administration never pushed this as a very strong argument after the war unfolded and we learned there weren't any stockpiles. No, one thing that I would do differently, we should have pushed the argument before the war, exactly as you've stated it. Um, we, I think, in a sense, the president became a fact witness using intelligence uh, in a way that probably wasn't wise. The strategic argument for Saddam Hussein was cancer in the Middle East has caused wars before, out from under the constraints that were put on him in 91, uh, still firing at American aircraft uh, on an almost daily basis with the capability to reconstitute his uh, biological and chemical weapons, some chance that he already has, and oh, by the way, he's used them before, and with the capability to reconstitute his nuclear weapons, how long do you want to wait to deal with this problem? That was the argument. And I think for a variety of reasons, given um, the way that this unfolded, going to the UN, making the speech about the weapons of mass destruction, um, it became all about the weapons of mass destruction and the strategic argument got somewhat lost. And so um, I, I remember saying to some senators exactly what I've just said to you, look, I don't, I don't lose a lot of sleep over Russian uh, weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, I worry about, you know, maybe a terrorist this or that, but I don't lose a lot of, s of sleep about that because Russia is even if an adversary from time to time, a responsible state. But weapons of mass destruction in the hands of an irresponsible state with a dictator who's used them, that's a proposition that the United States cannot live with uh, in, uh, in, in perpetuity. It's time to deal with it. Okay. Yeah. Marcus, hello. Hi, Madam Secretary, how are you? Fine. Thanks for joining us. And Thanks for cooperating with uh, the book I did on you some years ago. Um, Marcus Mabry. Are you a plant? <laughs> <laughs> Marcus Mabry from the New York Times, no. <laughs> uh, um, I wonder, based on what Katie was saying to you earlier, looking back over the whole landscape of seemingly intractable today, foreign policy challenges that we face, that the Obama administration still faces uh, after your t tenure, is there a place, is there an issue, whether it's North Korea, or whether it's Israel, Palestine, uh, whether it's um, Afghanistan, whether it's Iraq, is there a place where you felt you made an effort that maybe didn't come to fruition, there might have been one more step, one more agreement that you worked for, maybe that didn't happen. Is there a place where you felt if progress had been made, today we would have a substantively different challenge in one of those intractable places? Yeah. Um, actually, I think the place that um, I wish we had been able to close the deal was on Palestine and Israel, because I think there was a deal to take. Um, Ehud Olmert, at the end of his term, uh, as you know, he got into political and legal trouble in the spring of 2008, and he basically made the deal, uh, offered the deal to the Palestinians that I think is ultimately going to be the deal they'll have to take. And for a variety of reasons, largely they didn't think he could deliver, and after all, maybe you know there was an election coming and so forth and so on. I sometimes think they thought they might get a more favorable uh, Israeli government. They got Benjamin Netanyahu instead, and um, it, I wish that we had, and we tried in the last months, in kind of November, to at least get the Palestinians and the Israelis to deposit that deal with the United States and maybe we would have been starting from there instead of going all the way back to whether or not settlements get frozen. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about this, I will talk more about this uh, as I write the book, but you know, there were even, Olmert even had a concept of how Jerusalem might unfold with a capital for each a capital for the Palestinians in East Jerusalem, a capital for the uh, for Israel in West Jerusalem, 
uh, some kind of uh, management of the holy sites by an international group. Um, it was pretty close to what, if we ever get a deal, is going to be there. And I wish we'd had a way to deliver it. Do you have any hope for the current situation? Everything in, in me says, look, they don't have an option, the two of them, right? If, if pa the Palestinians need a state and the Israelis need a Palestinian state. So sooner or later, they're going to get this and they're going to close the deal. And I do think some of the underlying circumstances are better. The Palestinians under Salam Fayyad in the West Bank are showing what a Palestinian state could look like. It's got security forces that people trust. It's basically democratic institutions. It's got growth at almost 9%. It is clearly not a terrorist state. That's what the Palestinian state could look like. Israeli, the Israeli politics, thanks to first Ariel Sharon and then Ehu Olmert, and now Benjamin Netanyahu, there is almost nobody in Israel who believes in greater Israel anymore, except the very far right. And the Arabs have realized that there is a country in the Middle East that's a problem, and it begins with I, but it's not Israel. It's Iran. And they would like to have this thing settled. So I have to think, I'm a political scientist, and I have to think when everybody's interests start to come together that way, you're going to have to get a solution. But they've got to get back to the table. This, these preconditions and I won't negotiate until you do this, and uh, that's got to stop, and they've got to negotiate. Since Ru I meant to ask you earlier, since Russia is your foremost area of expertise, I read recently that you are the only Secretary of State who's not supporting ratifying the START Treaty. Is oh, that I, accurate? I didn't, I didn't sign the editorial uh, op-ed. Mm -hmm. Look, I, given the nature of the um, people who wrote that op-ed, it's not surprising <coughs> that it's a very um, fine op-ed. It's persuasive, and I find myself in a substantial agreement with a lot of it. Um, I'm working uh, very actively to try to bring about the best bipartisan result uh, for this treaty because we've always had bipartisan support for treaties and uh, we need to have bipartisan support for this treaty. There are some issues that have been raised um, about modernization. I think that uh, the administration has responded uh, to and if the funding is there, our nuclear infrastructure will be modernized. That's important as the numbers come down. And there are real questions about uh, defenses. Um, when we got out of the ABM Treaty and a year later signed the Moscow Treaty, bringing down offensive weapons totals, the point was to delink offense and defense. Because we're not in the Cold War now where the United States and, the, and Russia worry about mutual annihilation of one another. We need to have full range to do whatever we need to do on the defensive side. And so I think that these are things that can probably be handled. Um, and um, I'm going to speak to the treaty at an appropriate time. But it's, uh, it's not a matter of, uh, of disagreeing uh, in large part with what the secretaries have said. Yes, sir. Yes, Stephen Schlesinger, Sensory Foundation. Uh, getting back to Iraq. Why didn't the Bush administration allow the UN inspection to continue until, the, and maybe they would have not found no, no weapons of mass destruction during that period? What we were getting from the UN inspectors, and you can look at what Hans Blick said in his report to the UN on, in uh, January of, of uh, 2003, was that the Iraqis were not fully cooperating. And uh, yes, I, I mean, I guess you can inspect for a long, long time. And if you're not getting cooperation from that government, you don't know whether, whether you were finding weapons or not. We also had military forces that were built up in the region to uh, provide, uh, if you will, a sword for uh, Saddam Hussein to actually cooperate. And uh, at some point in time, uh, you have to decide whether or not you think this proposition of inspections is going to play out. And we decided that we didn't believe uh, that we were ever going to get the kind of cooperation from Saddam Hussein that would answer the very real questions about his weapons program. I'm also, frankly, just very glad he's out of power. Now, to be frank, we tried to take him out of power without going to war. Um, we tried to take him out of power by, um, we got a report from an Arab state that shall remain nameless that he would take a billion dollars to lead, lead, to leave. We said, deal, <laughs> right? 
Uh, we tried to um, um, find is that, him. Has that been made public before? Uh, yeah. I, 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 it may be in President Bush's book. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But uh, we did. We said, if you'll go, everybody's happy. Uh, secondly, there was the question, which you probably have read, and it's in the Woodward book, about Dora Farms. On the eve of the war, we thought that Saddam Hussein was at a place called Dora Farms and uh, thought that if you could launch a strike against him there, uh, you might not have to go to war. Um, nobody was anxious to engage in war. But as I said, at some point in time, you say, enough is enough. And uh, that's where we found ourselves. I'm Lucy Commissar. I'm a journalist. Following up your comments about WikiLeaks, which you said should be criminally charged by the U.S., uh, WikiLeaks and its founder considers itself a publisher, which in the new system of publishing on the int Internet seems to be appropriate. And he, see, he calls himself an editor-in-chief dealing with editors and journalists around the world. Among them are the editors and journalists of, of the New York Times. So if uh, WikiLeaks should be charged criminally for putting up this information, should the New York Times be charged criminally for doing the same thing? Well, I, as I said, the Justice Department will have to determine what the legalities are here. I just hope they are very, very actively determining exactly that. Um, WikiLeaks took purloined documents and spread them. Now, I have, may have my own views on whether or not um, legitimate newspapers should have taken up that, uh, that task but, and gone ahead and, and published them. But uh, it was WikiLeaks that made them available from whomever they got them. If our laws don't deal, and very often our laws are not capable of dealing with changed technological circumstances. I fully uh, understand that then somebody ought to look at the law and see how we can deal with these particular technological circumstances. It cannot be the case that documents that belong to the United States of America and are classified by the United States of America and that if I walked up to you and handed you a classified document, I would be committing a crime. Now, it cannot be that WikiLeaks handing to the entire world classified documents is not a crime. But somebody should figure out, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a Justice Department lawyer, uh, but unless you find a way to punish that behavior, uh, the United States of America is not going to be able to operate. How do you feel about major newspapers and websites I publishing go there information, if you I do did. have a certain point of view about it? I would have, I would have preferred that it, that it not be done, and I, I think there were requests that it not be done, uh, but I understand that there's a a kind of irresistible um, urge uh, or desire. Uh, perhaps some would say that they believe it's their responsibility to do so. Um, when I looked at what is there, I really wonder um, how much our uh, debate as a democratic society has been enhanced by the publication of gossip about what one of our diplomats said about the president of this country or the prime minister of that country. I don't, pub I don't frankly see the public value. But are there, are there parts of it that might be useful? For example, when Arab nations express their concern uh, over a nuclear Iran after Ahmadinejad sort of portrays him, himself as a friend of all Arabs, et cetera, et cetera, and when we see real trepidation among some Arab states about it, could that actually be useful in our foreign policy? I would have rather have left it in the hands of President Obama and Secretary Clinton to decide whether or not that was useful or not. Um, I don't think that it is probably, and I think I would have thought that it is not useful um, to have that exposed in the way that it was and that it's going to be a very long time before uh, a lot of those people express anything to us, um, and that is a real problem. Okay, back there. Yeah. Secretary Rice, Kim Davis, do you believe that some of the strategic criticism of your Iraq decision is a function of how the uh, Bush administration prosecuted the war, the, the tactics? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think the tactics in the war, certainly the, the uh, difficulty in, in the post-war period and the reconstruction 
um, I think is, is part of the problem uh, because uh, you didn't get immediate results that were, um, that were very favorable and very, um, uh, that looked as if the war had been worth it. I think once the surge went forth in uh, 2007 and it became clear that maybe Iraq could re emerge as a stable country, uh, then the strategic argument begins to make more sense to people. And uh, I think that's why uh, you have people now willing to at least contemplate the question of whether or not an Iraq with Saddam Hussein in this 2010 would have been a good thing um, is really uh, a good argument. And so, uh, yes, I think the post-war period had an effect on people's ability to see the strategic argument for uh, a Middle East without uh, Saddam Hussein. Why do you think the intelligence was so off about that the U U.S. troops would be greeted as liberators? You know what, actually that's not what U.S. intelligence said. Um, but that's what some pretty key officials like Dick Cheney a, said. A, a, some, uh, some people thought, and by the way, when the statue came down, there was a lot of greeting as liberators. Uh, go back and look at those pictures of people pulling down uh, Saddam Hussein's statue. Uh, no, uh, I'm just saying, at that particular moment in time, you had people who were cheering American soldiers. But look, nobody did this on the basis of a belief that somehow Americans were going to be greeted as liberators. It was done on the basis of the belief that Saddam Hussein was a threat and you needed to deal with Saddam Hussein. Um, I think the question of why the intelligence on the weapons was not as good as it might have been um, there are a lot of decisions to change the way that intelligence is uh, not so much collected but analyzed, um, how competing views are dealt with, uh, how those are communicated to the president. The whole creation of the DNI uh, was meant to deal with that problem. Sir, back there. No, yeah, the same thing. Michael Skoll of uh, Skoll and Serna, a retired Foreign Service officer. Uh, Madam Secretary, you raised the theme of American exceptionalism. Do you believe that one of the, um, the issues in North Korea and other places is that China has a fundamentally different view of itself as a global superpower, uh, that it's exceptional in very different ways, and do you think that's going to change at any time? Yeah. Um, I actually think that the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union was a competition about exceptionalism. Uh, there you had two very ideological powers in the sense of a view of how the world ought to, uh, how human history ought to play out. You don't sense that with China. Uh, you sense with China a country that's still trying to grow into its international role, um, a country that is driven overwhelmingly by its domestic concerns about growth. Um, Hu Jintao used to tell us that you needed 25 million, he needed 25 million jobs a year to sustain um, the harmonious society in China because they needed to be able to bring all those people from the outer hinterlands and get them into the cities. And so um, you have a sense of a foreign policy that at least in, in its current incarnation is more mercantilist than ideological. Now, that may change over time, and certainly the Chinese have felt that their experience and the way that they came through the global financial crisis uh, means something good about the Chinese system. So maybe you will see some ideological uh, elements emerge. But I think you, you don't see that um, just yet with China. In fact, one of the hardest things is to get China to play a ro global role that is commensurate with its increasing influence, which is why whether China really uh, does try to, um, to constrain North Korea is still a question. Yes. Uh, Andy Nagorski, East West Institute. Uh, Madam Secretary, w you mentioned in the context of START the, the offense defense question. Uh, now, with a little bit of distance, how do you evaluate the decision to change the missile defense plans in, in Europe and the possibilities of joint missile defense with Russia? Well, already um, we are seeing a Russia that has a different definition of what joint missile defense means. Um, and I think our allies, particularly in Eastern Europe, 
are going to be somewhat skeptical of the idea that there should be a kind of division of labor in missile defense in which Russia takes responsibility for the eastern part of Europe. I think that's not going to be really popular <laughs> in Poland and the Czech Republic and places like that. Um, I'm all for um, co cooperative missile defense with Russia. I think there's a lot that can be done with warning and sensors and uh, even maybe with interceptors. I think those are all very good things. Uh, but we have to remember that the NATO system is a NATO system of allies and that whatever Russia does within that system should be joint between NATO and Russia. It's not as if Russia has somehow now become a member of NATO with special responsibilities inside the, uh, the defensive system. So I think this can work, uh, but already you're getting some tensions about what the Russians think this means. and. Uh, that's not surprising uh, because it's early in the process. I'm actually as concerned about the strategic side. Um, I think that uh, what we want to do with missile defense is to be as robust technologically as we can possibly be. And so when, when you have uh, language that says uh, a current system or a current set of plans are not a problem, for um, Russia, which is what Russia is saying. You are, if you're not careful, you're walking into a circumstance in which if you change qualitatively or quantitatively what you're doing in missile defense, the Russians say, but wait a minute, we said the current plans were not uh, a problem. And um, I think you want to have as robust a missile defense as you possibly can. Let me ask you just quickly about the whole notion of American exceptionalism, because that has even become controversial, that, that term in this highly charged political environment. Do you think that, I mean, there's, there's so much hand-wringing about America being on the decline, not being able to compete economically in terms of its education, educational levels and, and how we're preparing kids to be the workforce of the future. And I'm just curious if you are concerned about that and what impact or how that might influence our position, our position in the world and our ability to be a leader in foreign policy. I think it's our single biggest problem is the lack of confidence, lack of optimism of Americans about the future. Because but is it, that founded? Uh, well, yes, uh, it is. And it's, uh, we see it in two major issues that we face that we're having a hard time facing up to. Now, I still believe that the United States is uh, exceptional in its conception, the American idea, uh, no tie of nationality, ethnicity, religion to the territory. Uh, it's exceptional in the way that it has integrated people from around the world for generations. It's exceptional in the way that it's been willing to fight for the rights of others, um, even when they didn't know their names. Uh, you know, uh, any ordinary country might not have stormed the beaches of Normandy to fight for uh, the liberties of those people. And so, yes, I do think there's an exceptionalism. But I am very concerned that um, some of the essence of what has made us that way is, uh, is fraying. Um, first of all, one of the reasons that the United States is exceptional is we've integrated people from all over the world. And when I listen to the immigration debate in the United States, it's a country I don't recognize. Um, we can't possibly live with 12 million, 10 to 12 million people in the shadows. They're not going home. Who are we kidding? Uh, we can't live with circumstances in which um, people actually talk about taking away citizenship rights from children born in this country if they're born of illegals. We can't be in a country that people are so fearful that they won't go to an emergency room. Uh, because of fear of uh, deportation. Something's really wrong in our immigration policies. And when you have a comprehensive immigration reform that John McCain, George W. Bush, and Ted Kennedy all want, and you can't get it through the Congress, you realize how incredibly easy it is to demagogue this issue. And the only thing that keeps the United States of, of America from the sclerotic demographics of Europe and the tragic demographics of Russia is immigration. And I really, frankly, don't care if it is the, the ambitious person who comes to make $5, not 50 cents, or Sergey Brin's parents who bring him here at seven years old from Russia, and he founds Google. The most ambitious people have always wanted to come and be a part of America, and that's our life's blood. So we've got to get our immigration policies in line. Secondly, K-12 education. 
when I can look at your zip code and tell whether or not you're going to get a good education, something is really wrong. And we are uh, sacrificing not the kids who can, whose parents can send them to private schools or uh, the kids whose parents send them to Palo Alto High School where I live, but the kids who are most dependent on the public schools that are failing them to give them a way out. And it's going to have an effect on us in two major ways. And I think it's a national security problem for us. First of all, it's going to make our people uncompetitive, which means that if we can't train and educate people to the jobs that are available, because, you know, the $18 an hour unskilled labor job is gone forever. And so if people are not able to take the jobs that are available, then we are going to turn inward and we are going to try to protect. And somebody will always be able to outprotect us. And the economic pie is going to get smaller and smaller, and this is going to continue to spiral down. But there's an even more dire uh, circumstance that emerges from this education problem. You know, we're not united by blood or nationality or ethnicity. We're not united by religion. We are united by an idea. And it was an exceptional idea. It was that class didn't matter. It didn't matter where you came from. It mattered where you're going. Uh, you could come from humble circumstances. You could do great things. It's the law cabin. And uh, that's not true for too many of our kids today. And so, uh, yes, I, I, it may be for a foreign policy specialist among a lot of people interested in foreign policy a bit blasphemous to say what I'm about to say. Um, there are a lot of problems out there. Proliferation, Afghanistan, the Middle East. But the United States needs internal repair more than it needs to do anything else. I was recently in Halifax, Canada at a uh, meeting that the Defense Minister of Canada put on. And um, there were a lot of Europeans there and Asians and they were all saying, but you know, we're really worried now. The United States may because of its problems, it may not lead. And, uh, you know, if the funny thing about the United States is when it does lead, nobody likes it. And when it doesn't lead, everybody <laughs> doesn't like it. And so I said to them, you know, we may need a little time. We may need a little time for internal repair because without it, we won't be optimistic enough or confident enough to lead. Are you optimistic that internal repair can actually take place? I am. But uh, it's going to require, uh, especially given the polarized yeah, yeah, government but, we have. But you know, our look, our politics has always been a little rough. You know, it was it was after all Thomas Jefferson that that uh, leaked a letter saying George Washington was senile because he was mad at Alexander Hamilton. I mean, you know, we've had some <laughs> bad politics for a long time. <laughs> but um, I, I do think that our politics is sped up and it's very loud right now. Um, look, I like cable television as much as anybody and I watch it and it's fun, but it's like sport. Okay? It's, it's, nobody listens to anybody, everybody shouts at any, everybody and toward the end I have a headache, frankly. <laughs> and somehow our political institutions, which were not built for speed by the founding fathers, need the ability to slow down quiet down. People, you can't be in a position that a microphone shoved in your face about every controversial issue and you have to declare today and everybody goes to their corner and then they can't move because we'll say, oh my goodness, they moved. And so um, I do think the politics has to slow down and we need to pick two or three things that we're going to do and do them well. And uh, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I've seen the United States do a lot of impossible things before that, you know, the next day seem inevitable. But this is a big agenda, and particularly on K-12 education, we're losing time. With every year that passes and every class of children that don't read by the time that they're third grade, you've lost another group of people who will never read. And so it's not something that can wait very long. Well, Secretary of State, Professor Condi, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.